I'm thrilled that you're with us today. We are in the home stretch of our series that we've been in all summer long called Bear Fruit. And uh, we're learning to let Jesus transform us from the inside out as he transforms us. We, we're we're going to act more like him. We're going to think more like him. We're going to love more like him. That's the goal here. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And um, I want to just, something I always, you know, I spend a couple of minutes before we dive into the, the topic of the morning, just to remind us, because I think it's important. I think it's very important. When we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, we really are meaning just that. This is the fruit of the Spirit. This isn't the fruit of your tremendous efforts, okay? This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the tree, you know, Jesus said, I, I am the vine, you are the branches. He's, he's the vine, and so if you have a good tree, it produces good fruit, and that's who we're connected to. Uh, so this is really what we're talking about, the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the character of the Holy Spirit, the character of God. That's really what we're getting at here. And when you walk by the Spirit, this is what the Scriptures tell us, when you walk by the Spirit, this is the kind of fruit that will begin to, to manifest in our life. And it, so it happens from the inside out. This isn't a, 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 a sermon or a, or a series about how to behave better or how to put on a better face or something like that. We're talking about a, there's this good tree and it produces good fruit. We want to be connected to that tree. I thought of another, you know, another way we could have said it if we didn't want to use the fruit analogy like the Bible does, you could say the signs. These are the signs of walking in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the signs of walking in the Spirit. So if you're walking, you should see these, these signs. And uh, I, I thought it's important to remember these are not the commandments. These are not the commandments of the fruit. The command in the Scripture, if you kind of look a few verses up, it's actually walk by the Spirit. That's the command, is walk by the Spirit. And these are the signs that will follow if we're doing that. Growing Jesus fruit, as I like to call it, is not about adopting another set of rules, rituals, and regulations. Uh, it's not another system or another set of laws that'll force us to get in line. It's really not about external behavior at all. Now, that's going to follow. That's the fruit. But it's not about trying to get that external behavior just right. Because what it, this is, is, is what God wants to do in the interior of our hearts. We're all on the same page there, I hope. We're all, it's what he wants to do in the interior of our hearts, our spirit. He wants to actually help you and me become different people. That's exciting, right? To become the, 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 true, the truest version of us that, that we were meant to be. This is about transformation. It's not about behavior management. Transformation. It's not about adopting better manners, right? It's not about hiding what you, what you really want to do. It's about the Holy Spirit's breathing life into us so thoroughly and so refreshingly, it actually changes what we want. It changes our want-tos. It changes our instincts. And so that's what Jesus wants to do here. And, and so what, what is it that the Spirit is doing? He's doing these things. He's doing things like love. He's creating joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that the Holy Spirit is growing. And of course, see, God has made us in His image. We're image bearers of the Lord. And so as you become more like Jesus, as you learn to act more like Jesus, we're acting more like Jesus, less like jerks, right? We love that. And as we become more like Jesus, what we're becoming is we're becoming more of who you were meant to be. That's who you were created to be. This is who you were meant to be. So God knows who you should be. He knows what you could be, what you can be. And he knows probably the best version of you better than you do. He knows the best version of me better than even I do. And he's helping us become more like more like Jesus, the image of God. That's who we were meant to be. So we are, uh, we're, we're down to the final three. We've, we've covered six of these fruits. And today we are looking at faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm excited about this one because uh, right off the bat, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something very interesting about this word that, that for some of you will be a big aha moment. It'll be one of those sermons, I think, that start to it answers a bunch of questions, and it, like, creates a bunch of questions, like, as we're talking here. So the Holy Spirit's going to be speaking to you, so just, just be listening to him. Here's the first interesting thing about this word that stirs up some questions. Faithfulness, and the word for faith in the Old and the New Testament, is the same word. It's the same word. The word for faithfulness is the same word as the word for faith. They didn't distinguish between those two 
concepts the way we do. Now, this is, you know, when you start to think about it, and you think about all the scriptures that talk about faith, and then all the scriptures talk about faithfulness, this is kind of mind-blowing. In the Hebrew, it's this word aman, and in the Greek, it's pistis. The Hebrew is the Old Testament, Greek, uh, New Testament was written in the Greek, pistis is the Greek. Faith and faithfulness are the same word. So when translating this, the scriptures, we'd like to have the Bible that we have today, the translators, the linguists, had to uh, really look at the context. Because in English, we've sort of divided out these concepts pretty well. And so we, they, they had to use just kind of, you know, their wisdom. Wh which word should we use here? There's really no perfect English equivalent to that word, pistis, or that word, aman. Um, we're going to try to come close today. But in the ancient mind, just keep, keep, keep that in mind. In the ancient mind, this is the same word. Now, this kind of rattles a bunch of stuff for me, right? Because now I think about these scriptures that says to live by faith. To their mind, that's the same as saying to live by faithfulness. Huh. For them to have faith is always to be faithful. And to be faithful, you do so because you have faith. So there's something of each that is contained in the other. I think it's really, really cool. What makes this kind of confusing and, and uh, frustrating is that for us, especially over time, faith just might be one of the most uh, kind of confusing, contentious, conflicting terms in all of Christianity. And, and uh, because so much of Protestant Christianity, that's what we are, if you didn't know, we're Protestants, like uh, Protestant Christianity. So we, we, can, we can critique ourselves, right? Because we're, we're, I mean, we're critiquing from the inside. I don't come up here and, and tell you all the things that are wrong with uh, Catholicism these days because I'm not a Catholic. But we can talk about Protestantism. Protestant Christianity has an obsession, and we've had an obsession for a long time. And the obsession is personal salvation. Now stay with me here. Personal salvation. And by this, I don't mean sort of this holistic uh, uh, salvation like the state of Shalom, like you see in the Old Testament. I mean this idea that Jesus is your personal Savior. He's your personal Savior. And so the role of the Christian then is to trust in the saving work of Jesus, and, which is partly true. Um, but it's only part of the, the whole biblical worldview, and it's only part of the gospel. And so we kind of fixate on that. We fixate there that there, so there's this narrative that can go in our circles that goes, well, you're a sinner. Christ, he came for your sin. So if you believe the right things and you repent of your sin, then you'll go somewhere better when you die. Hallelujah. Have a great day. Come back next week to hear basically the same message. Okay, great. You know, it's good news. Uh, but about a third of Christianity, it's about a third of Christians, it's estimated, stay locked into this very isolated framework through the whole of their spiritual journey. And honestly, I think this is why so many Christians are bored. Because I think it's, it's why after a long time, you see, you start to think, like, what am I doing? is this working? What am I after here? Right? In this, in this framework, spirituality ends up having very little to do with your actual everyday life. Like, just, just for show of hands here, not to embarrass anybody, show of hands, raise your hand if you consider yourself saved in this house. Okay, a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, were you saved before this morning? <laughs> and, and yet you came back to church, Right? But for like a third of the Christian people in the world, getting saved is sort of job done. It's why actually most Christians, most of your Christian brothers and sisters in America don't come to church. It's not that they're terrible people. They just don't see the point. They got saved, right? And so this is how, in this spirituality, it, it doesn't have much to do with your everyday life. It doesn't speak to how you invest your time. It doesn't get to the shape of of how you live and, and how you spend your money and how you spend your time and who you give your life to, who you're putting your trust in on a daily basis. It's sort of this isolated category. Their faith becomes this isolated thing. And faith functions as kind of just this dogma in your head. You have a certain set of beliefs. If someone said, like, what do you believe that makes you a Christian? You'd be able to probably list a few things and you're good, right? You think, okay, that's what makes me a Christian. I, I believe these certain things. And the most people, and there might be people in here, and it's no condemnation. It's, it's something that we all fall into. You would describe your faith as the set of things you believe, right? And so faith functions as the set of dogma in your head. It's like a birth certificate. 
you hold on to. Your birth certificate is pretty important, right? But you probably keep it at home in some file cabinet or a safe or if you still have it, you know. Nobody walks around with their birth certificate like every day. Yes, still. <laughs> still born. Still from Pasadena. Yay for me. <laughs> right? You don't walk around with that. It's important, but it sort of doesn't affect your day-to-day life. It doesn't integrate with the rest of your life. So, so there's this Protestant obsession that faith means what you believe in your head. And, and Jesus becomes basically the one or the instrument that saves me from hell. So that's great, but then, but then what? I, I, thought of this, I thought of this picture of like, imagine you're on an airplane and you're hitting a lot of turbulence and maybe an engine goes out and it's looking bad and it's rocking and it's, you know, it's swaying back and forth and everybody's screaming and the little things are falling from the ceiling and the pilot, he's trying, he gets, he gets you to the, you see the airport, you start to see the lights of the airport show up and he gets you down and it, and it bumps, and you know, it's bumpy, but he gets you on the ground and he comes to a stop and everybody erupts in joy. Woo! Thank you, pilot. And you might even cheer and as you're leaving, you might shake his hand. Some people might hug him. Good job. Thank you so much. Right? He saved you. And you're going down and you get your luggage and you notice he's still following you, the pilot. You get in a taxi and you go to your hotel and you're getting, whew, you're still talking about, can you leave that flight? And you get your key and there's the pilot. He's just standing there. (laughs) And you're like, why are you here? What are you doing? I appreciate it. Why are you still in the room? And that's how a lot of us, I think, feel about Jesus. We're kind of like, I'm good now. What is Jesus still for, right? This, is, this really gets at a, a lot of our issues. I, I don't have time to get all into them. In the church, we don't know what Jesus is for. There's, so that's a, a, we have this obsession with just the personal salvation element of Jesus. There's also a Protestant omission uh, because, uh, yes, faith moves in the idea of, of trusting in Jesus. He's Christ. He's our Savior. But beyond that, into the lordship of Jesus, faith means allegiance. Faith means allegiance. Because when you get allegiance, you get it all right here. You get it all. That Jesus is, say it, Dad. Lord. Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord. Now, I know we hear that phrase today. We say it here at this church a lot. But even, even some of us, we can hear that so much, it kind of becomes familiar to us. It doesn't really have that same kind of punch. We don't really know. I think we don't know what we're saying. I said it most of my life and didn't really know what I was saying. I thought it was a slogan. And, but we have to understand, like, for that first century church, this was not just a clever phrase. In the first century, the, the Christians weren't killed in the Roman Empire for telling Gentiles how to go to heaven when they die. Did you know that? The Romans had no problem with you telling people how to go to heaven when, when they die. It wasn't why Christians were hated. The future resurrection was not a threat to Rome and their, their dominating system. The Romans cared about the present moment. They cared about what you were doing right now, who you were worshiping, where your allegiance was right now. They wanted ultimate allegiance to Roman patriotism and the political party called Caesar Augustus. That was what was important. That was what was important. They didn't care what you thought about your afterlife. And so to confess Jesus as Lord to those early Christians, as it should be for us, it is a pledge of allegiance to a different kind of kingdom. It's a kingdom that we long to see. We don't see it in full full right now. It's kind of already, but not yet. But, But we long to see it. And it is a kingdom that is being birthed even now. And it's not birthed through the ballot box. It's birthed through the hearts of people. Through the hearts of people. And so we could define faith this way. We could say that faith isn't just mentally assenting to something, but faith is active trust. Faith is active trust. It's it's ultimately not about just the certainty of your thoughts and making sure you're real certain about them. It's what you put into action. And here we get into where faith and faithfulness start to bleed together, and we can start to see, okay, I see why this is the same word. It's what you put into action. You might have some doubts about stuff. You might have questions. You might have distractions. But what you do is you believe enough to take the step. You believe, that's what the disciples did. You know, the disciples turned out to be wrong about a lot of stuff. They kind of thought Jesus was going to be like the great uh, 
sort of military savior at first. Some of the disciples did. But you know what they did? They were wrong about that, but they still followed him. They followed. They had enough faith to believe, even though they didn't have it all figured out and they kept getting it wrong. They had enough faith to take that step. So faith is active trust. And as we understand this perspective of faith, now we start to understand why the scripture writers, the ancient writers and the ancient mind did not need to separate these words out. What faith and faithfulness. One of my favorite definitions I heard of faithfulness uh, was an old pastor. I can't remember his name now, but he said this. He said, faithfulness is love that hangs on. It's love that hangs on, love that doesn't quit, love that keeps on going. It's that, it's that mama that sticks around. It's that friend that keeps on believing you and sticks closer than a brother. It's that, that grandmother who keeps praying and praying and keeps going after the Spirit of God on your behalf. Faithfulness is not doing something good It's doing something good and doing something good and doing something good and doing something good. That is faithfulness. Faithfulness is like divine repetition. It's love and joy on repeat, right? That peace that keeps on coming. It's it's the kindness that's relentless. It's goodness that's on the same track over and over and over right? Uh, the other day I was, I was in the kitchen and I think I was washing some dishes here and my little girl walks in the street, uh, walks in the room, Adeline, and she, um, she goes, Alexa, play Girl on Fire. <laughs> and so it starts playing and we're jamming to Alicia Keys together and uh, singing, belting it out the top of her lungs, just, yeah, girl is on fire. <laughs> she's, she's so cute. She's just going at it and we're jamming and I'm scrubbing, drying. And uh, we go at it and about... I don't know, 12, 14, 15 minutes later, I realized this song is still on. It didn't even dawn on me, and I'm realizing this is a long song, and I realized she had put it on repeat. <laughs> and then she had left the room. So I was in the room, I was like, why am I still listening to the song? She puts, a, she puts these songs on repeat and then leaves. Um, but that's faithfulness. Faithfulness, it never stops. It's relentless. It's the tortoise that just relentlessly keeps going to the end of the journey, to the finish line. Faithfulness is the repeated choice to move in the direction of your faith. It's the repeated choice to move in the direction of your faith. That's faithfulness. So what is faithfulness? It's making the choice of faith every day. That's how they work together. It's making that choice every day. Faithfulness is choosing to follow Jesus over and over again, continuing that journey with him. So faithfulness, see, faithfulness is not just what we would call faith, right? It's not just thanking him for being our savior. It's not just having Jesus as your savior. He's the pilot who got you on the ground. But you continue to follow him. You walk in his steps. You say, I want to start being like you, Mr. Pilot. And you walk, that's faithfulness, right? It's, it's making him not just our savior, but our Lord. It's why we say Lord and Savior. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. It's not just a nice little clever phrase. It's, it really is. It deals, that's the faith and the faithfulness coming together there. So that helps us sort things out. A lot of things in the Bible kind of can feel, feel like contradictions at first because we separate these words out and we, and we tend to separate them out in a, in a huge way in, in our English language. Now it makes sense. In Genesis chapter 15, Abraham, it says, believes God and God credits to him credits that to him as righteousness. What did he do? He believed. Okay. But then later in Genesis 26, it says God considered Abraham righteous because of his, you think it's going to say like belief or his faith. It says because of his obedience. That's what made God consider him righteous. Well, was it obedience or was it faith? Well, to the Hebrew mind, the answer is yes. Of course. Yes, because if you have faith, you're going to walk in the direction of the person that you have faith in, if you have faithfulness. You're going to walk in the direction of the person you have faith in. You're going to trust them enough to actually act, to, you know, put your money, your, your, your feet where your mouth is. You're, you're going to trust them enough. In the New Testament, you have the Apostle Paul saying that we're saved by faith, like Ephesians, was Ephesians 2.8. We're saved by faith. Save by grace through faith. And then James comes along and says, yeah, but faith without works is dead. Hmm. And people say, well, James and Paul really should get together and talk more often because they they need to get their story straight, right? I mean, if they're both going to come up with scripture here. Paul says it's faith. James says it's faith plus works. So what's going on? Now, wait a second. Faith and faithfulness 
are the same word in their language. So there's no contradiction here, right? Faith is faithfulness. It, it's, it's taking that step in that direction, right? So of course, faithfulness without works is meaningless, right? If I told my wife, I'm, I'm going to be really faithful to you. I'm, I'm so faithful to you. I'm going to go out on this date with this other girl <laughs> Friday, but I'm faithful. That's not like being a having bad faithfulness, that's like doesn't make any sense, right? It's absurd. It's an absurdity of language. You can't, you, can't, you can't be faithful and not faithful at the same time. You're just not faithful, right? And so faith and faithfulness, they work together. All right. So now as with all these fruits of the Spirit, every, every week we've been looking at, we kind of look at, well, how, you know, our, our first question to ourselves typically, if you're like me, is, well, how do I be more this way? How do I act more this way? How do I force myself to be more faithful? How can I develop faithfulness? And the answer is always, at first, the answer is you can't, because these are the fruit of the Spirit. What we can do is let God grow it in us by letting His nature become our nature. That's what we're after. We're letting His nature become our nature. And an apple, an apple grows from an apple tree, right? You can't manufacture an apple. Oh, I'm sure the Aggies are, are working on that. They're really smart about that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, you, you know, apples grow from a tree, and a healthy apple grows from a healthy tree. And, and so when the tree is healthy and it's growing strong, your apple's going to be healthy, it grows apples. The apple actually has very little to do with the process, doesn't it? It's not sitting there trying really hard to be a good apple. Its job is really to hang on. Don't let the wind shake you off. I need this tree. It's to hang on. And so in short, we can become faithful because we're connected to a God who is faithful. So the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness because the God we're connected to is faithful and His life is flowing into us. I want to take a dive just real quickly through, through, through a forest of faithfulness here in the Scriptures. Just soak in these words while I read them. In Leviticus it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's the one we're connected to. Joshua 23 says, You know with all your heart and soul that not one of the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Hebrews 10 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who, is pro who promised is faithful. Psalm 36. I'm going to break all my rules and read out of the message here because this is so good. God's love is meteoric. His loyalty, astronomic, his purpose, titanic, his verdicts, oceanic. Yet in his largeness, nothing gets lost. Not a man, not a mouse slips through the cracks. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is just to forgive. 2 Timothy 2, 13, one of my favorite ones says, even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. That's faithfulness. That's faithfulness. To talk about growing faithfulness in us is to understand God's faithfulness. We're growing in God's faithfulness. Okay. And I want to look at a, a, at a story Jesus told that's going to help us here. If you have your Bibles, you can turn over to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look at an illustration Jesus gives to kind of flesh this out. He tells a parable of a, a master in this story. There's this master who's heading out on a long journey. And so he calls in three of his most trusted servants and, and he gives them each some money to invest while he's gone. I guess this is kind of just a thing he did back then. Maybe there's not a stock market. So to invest, you got to like actually go out into the marketplace and invest. So he's giving them some money. He entrusts each of them with a, a different amount of gold, um, Actually, and that gets into some interesting things, but that's not important for our purposes today. Um, what's important is that when he returns, in verse 16, we find that two of the servants, these employees, have doubled their investment. Way to go. While one of them basically uh, shoved the money in a mattress. Now, when Jesus is telling this parable, notice the master, what is his response to them? He does not say, well done, thou successful servant. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Faithful. That's what he's praising here. So, now, success did follow the, the actions of the first two men. 
but what the master is praising here is not their success, not the return so much as their obedience, their faithfulness. Well done, good and faithful servants. And you have to picture in a story like this, he wasn't asking these guys to go out and like be brilliant or to do something that they hadn't seen him do over and over and over again. He, he's not praising their great ingenuity. He's not praising their brilliance. But you have to imagine that these guys, these servants, have probably followed in his footsteps over the years and watched this master. He's so good at it. We've just watched him do it a hundred times. I mean, he, does, he makes this deal, and then he flips and he turns around, and he always ends up with more. We see how he does it. We see how he does it. And they've watched him. They've walked in his footsteps. And what he's praising them for is, is way to emulate what I'm doing. Basically, they're copying what he's doing. And the third servant, if you notice, if you look down, he's not chastised for trying and failing. He's not chastised because, well, your investments didn't come to anything. Man, you're a terrible investor. No, no, no. No, no, no. He's, he's rebuked because he didn't even try. He was faithless from the very start. So the fruit of faithfulness is not found in how successful our works are and how successful our prayers seem to be, what the results appear to be. And I understand it's really easy to get into this mindset where we judge how spiritual am I? How good am I doing? How good is my prayers doing based on how much is God doing what I've told him to do? We can't help but start to think that way. And that may be faith, but that's not faithfulness. See, we confuse fruit uh, when it comes to spiritual matters with success, it results. But to God, the fruit that he is looking for, it's not a return on your investment. It's seeing that what he has planted in you, what he has exhibited, what he has shown in his words and his work and his deeds, is that showing up on the outside? Are we walking like our master? Are we following in the footsteps of our rabbi? Right? He's our Jesus. The outcome is not up to us. Now that's liberating for some of us, right? The outcome is not up to us. The glory is not ours. You might be praying for something. You might pray for something for a long time. And I have, I have prayers that are continuing. I still have prayers, right? I'm praying, I, I'm praying for, for friends, for family, for loved ones to come to the Lord. And I haven't seen, in all those cases, I haven't seen the results yet. But you know what? I'm reminded the outcome is not up to me. The glory is not ours. The battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's, people, Right? The outcome is up to him. It is the Lord's. Well, what are we called to do? We are called to be faithful. The master put his faith in these servants with the understanding that they would be obedient, trustworthy, they would be devoted, that they would value what he put in their hand, right? Because the Lord has put something in our hands, that we would value that. So the results, results is not what we're measured by. We're not measured by results obedience is. That is our calling. Faithfulness in action is obedience. The first two men, they knew the master's heart. They had watched him do this, and they were able to go out into the world and demonstrate to kind of represent him well, almost be like a image bearer of the master out in the marketplace, right? They represented his, his, him. They demonstrated his will. It's about faithful obedience. Obedience is what allows us to participate in the kingdom of God. And obedience is, is how the kingdom of God gets shown into the earth. Obedience is not, listen, the obedience is not the means of, the, of our salvation. Obedience is the means of our transformation. That was good. I'm going to say that again because that's your tweetable moment right there. Obedience is not the means of your salvation, right? But it is the means of your transformation, obedience. Faith, coupled by our action, is a reflection of our faithfulness to God, that we really believe who he says he is. Do you really believe who he says? Do you really trust that when he gives something to us and asks us to do something with it, that he's going to be with us in that? I think it's also interesting in this story, uh, it says that the master returned after a long time. After a long time, 
Another ingredient we could add to our definition of faithfulness is it's this repeated choice to continue in the direction of our faith, to be devoted to our mission over time. So we could add that phrase. These, these first two men, uh, apparently they were willing to be obedient for a long time. They went out and they watched their investment of their efforts grow probably very slowly, very slowly, day by day, week after week. They didn't freak out and be like, oh, the master could be back any time now. We haven't, we haven't really made much. No, that wasn't their worry because they were doing what they saw him do and they were doing what he told them to do. And sometimes to be good and faithful servants means we have to have long obedience in the same direction. Long obedience, that's a good definition of faithfulness right there. Long obedience in the same direction. Even when we're not really sure if we're ever going to see the benefits of it ourselves. We might not witness it with our own eyes, right? You, you remember the, the story of Abraham. It says that he was faithful even though he never saw the fruit of his faithfulness with his own eyes. Abraham never actually got to see the creation of the nation of Israel, right? But God told him he had a promise. And so he found God trustworthy and God considered him faithful. May we hear the words of the master on judgment day. Well done, good and faithful servant. We can hear those. We can hear those. And so we find, once again, just as with all these fruits of the Spirit, there is, a, there is a partnership at work here. Yes, God is growing faithfulness in us. It is Him. But He has also created us to be choice makers, right? He's created us to be creatures of free will. And we can partner with Him or we can resist Him. And, and we, can, we have a role to play by choosing to surrender. That's really our role is to surrender our wills, to surrender to His work in us. That apple, it can't just sit there and say, I, I want to be an orange, right? It's got to just surrender. I'm an apple. I was created to be an apple. Just give up. I'm just going to give up and, and, and be the best apple I can be. That's what we got. We choose to remain faithful to Christ. Now, this, this gets to a very important question that we have to ask ourselves here. We have to be honest. And that is this, who or what are you ultimately faithful to? What are you really faithful to? To what story do you pledge your ultimate allegiance? Maybe another way to ask it is, is who or what do you ultimately place your faith in? What are you putting your faith in? Because you will be faithful to whatever you pledge your ultimate allegiance to, wherever your faith really is in, whatever you trust, that is really what you're going to be faithful to when the chips are down. Some people pledge allegiance to the gods of success and reputation. And you know, families have actually suffered uh, because someone in the family has this this vision for life that was greater than the responsibilities around them that they had originally agreed to. And when that happens, families get neglected because someone is faithful to a different vision. Relationships get neglected because of this God of success. Some people pledge allegiance to, to uh, American exceptionalism or, or nationalism, and it, and it pulls them into thinking just one way, and it rips apart relationships with people who think differently about economics or politics or whatever it is. We've seen it happen. Some people pledge allegiance to the idols of comfort and security and control. And if that's, if that's where you have placed your faith in, that is where you will pledge allegiance to. And you will be faithful to those things when the chips are down. You'll be faithful to your idol. So where you pledge allegiance is where you will surrender your will and we all surrender our will to something, to someone or something. We'll be faithful to something, and we'll be unfaithful to everything else. And it's based on where you pledge your ultimate allegiance. The Bible says you can't have two masters, so we have to, we have to believe it. Now, we just said that faithfulness is devotion to a, a mission over time. It's devotion over time. It's remaining in faith. It's remaining in trust, even when things uh, don't look amazing right now. I want us to look at one more scripture before we go, and this is in Luke chapter 22. This is a, 
powerful passage. I'm sure you've seen it before. Luke chapter 22, something in the life of Jesus. It's a little scene. Something very interesting happens, and it's also uh, sometimes misunderstood in some circles. Let's get this. And so Jesus is nearing the end of his life. It's that night before, and uh, he's about to be betrayed and crucified, but something happens. In verse 39, it says that Jesus went out as usual to the, to the Mount of Olives. His disciples followed him, and on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond and knelt down and he prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. It says an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood. This is a physician writing this too, by the way. Luke is a, was an ancient doctor. And so he says that the sweat from Jesus was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And this scripture has uh, bothered some people because especially kind of over the past hundred years, in the 20th century or so, uh, scholars have read this idea that, look, God the Father here, he's exploiting the Son. Look, this is like cosmic child abuse. But I think this is a misreading of the text because it's not about the father exploiting the son. What this passage really is about is the son's faithfulness where he pledges his allegiance. We're seeing Jesus' allegiance in action here. This is about Jesus' faithfulness to a faithful father, which, and it shines most beautifully and kind of hauntingly in those, those words that he says, not my will, but yours be done. Do you see what's happening here? There's this tension that Jesus is facing, that present reality. Now, this is Jesus, right? Well, you would think, like, he's going to have no problem with this. He's just like, that's eh, all right. It's all going to be good. Um, but the present reality didn't look good for him. It was a very real suffering he's going through. And the, the scripture writers are making sure we understand. This is real suffering. He's not putting on pretend. And his present reality is a crushing one, what he's about to face. But at the same time, he is, he's holding this future hope. And, he's, and there's this tension now for Jesus, right? There's this between the present moment of God, where are you right now? Where are you? And why are my circumstances like this? I thought it was going to be better than this. You know, we go through this. And, and, and is this really what I signed up for? Whew. And there's this longing, like, I know where the story is headed. But right now there's just disappointment. Even in my friends, there's disappointment. There's this gap between the present reality and this future hope. So I have this... I have this decision. I have this choice right now. Do I become faithless and despairing? Do I stop this journey in its tracks because it's just so hard? Do I really believe this or do I press on forward? Do I press on even still? And in the scene, this is very important. What's happening is Jesus is demonstrating where the fruit of faithfulness is born. This is really important, guys. We're almost done. The fruit of faithfulness in your life is not born in comfort. The fruit of faithfulness is fertilized in struggle. And that's hard news for, for those who were hoping to skate through life with no problems. Man, what? No. But I'll tell you what, for those of you who are going through it right now, this is reassuring news. This is powerful news. This is life-giving news. You're not, it's not that you're doing anything wrong, right? Because this is good news for people who aren't living in denial and who actually recognize that life can get tough. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not a glutton for punishment. I'm not saying, yay, God, bring on struggle. Woohoo! Um, but it is to say that when struggle is present, flourishing is still available. It still is because flourishing is not about the outcomes of, of life being what I want them to be. That's not what I base it by. Flourishing is about becoming the kind of person that brings a kind of life to the world. God is much more interested in what he's doing inside me than what's going on around me, right? It's about growing into the image of Jesus. That's what he is really after in my life, growing me into the image of Jesus so I can be a blessing to the world. Over and over and over and over in scriptures, we see, we find this reality that the presence of God, his, his manifestation of his goodness and his faithfulness, where does it seem to be most on display? The wilderness, over and over, we get these scriptures, right? Israel was called to be God's chosen nation, to represent him in the world, right? 
He rescues them. He delivers them from Egypt. Yay, it's freedom. But what happens first? They have to spend four decades learning to become these people. Where? The wilderness. The wilderness. And then from the children of Israel to Jesus himself. How does Jesus kick off his ministry? He gets baptized in the River Jordan. That's a cool story, right? Remember, God like speaks, the clouds part, the dove falls down. Man, this is a great beginning. And then what happens? He's called beloved. He's called good. And then he's immediately sent into the wilderness, a place of struggle where he like starves for 40 days. The wilderness is this place of challenge. It's a place of setbacks. It's a place of crisis. Why? Because what we're eventually told is Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. He is. And do you know the name Israel? Do you know what it means? Struggle. The name Israel literally means struggle. Jesus struggles just as Israel struggles in that wilderness. But where Israel failed, Jesus is victorious. And so Paul later tells us in, in the book of Romans, uh, Romans 11, that you, have been, you and I have been grafted into Israel. Remember that language? And so for anyone who takes on this beloved identity of God, we're seeking to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. We want to grow. We are grafted into Israel. We are literally grafted into the name struggle. We're grafted into this, which means that we can guarantee that one of the ways that we're going to be formed into the shape of Christ is through struggle, right? That's why Paul said, don't, don't be surprised when this happens. You've been grafted into the nation of struggle, <laughs> right? Paul said, I am crucified with Christ and I am risen with Christ. I got to tell you, I, I spent many years of my early faith struggling against struggle. Uh, I, I assumed I was the expert. Uh, I was just maybe special. Um, I was the exception to the rule. I would read my Bible, and yeah, I see Jesus. I see the disciples and the apostles and all the early church. I see them all going through that. But you know what? Maybe other Christians have to go through this. Maybe they have to go through struggle to be formed, but I'm different. I'm just going to believe that I'm different. I get to go from spiritual high to spiritual high to spiritual high, right? I mean, I'm the head, not the tail. I, you know, all the, this is what I wanted. Without struggle, I thought to myself, I thought, hey, God loves me too much for me to struggle in life. Life should be easy. It should come, it should come really naturally. But it's often in the struggle. Why I've noticed in, in my, uh, gosh, 25 years of, of being committed to following Jesus, it's often in the struggle that I am most formed. When I think back, and I'm not saying God is the author of, of tragedy by any means. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there can be something birthed in you through the way in which we decide to show up, the way we decide to live in the struggle. How you choose to show up, how you choose to surrender to what God is up to, to his faithfulness, rather than constantly fighting against it. I've noticed in my life that I've been most formed, when I'm honest, I've been most formed in seasons of struggle. And here's why I think that is. The reason is because for me, I, I think it's there, it's in those seasons of struggle, it's in the wilderness, that I am most prone to surrender the illusion of control. Because I like to walk around with that illusion a lot. That feels good. And, and in the wilderness, in the struggle, is when all of that comes crashing down and I see things clearly. I, fi I finally let the Spirit do His work. It's in the struggle that we're most formed, I think, because it's where we begin to crave the presence of God. You know, when you've kind of lost everything you thought was important to you, what do you have left but the presence of God? That becomes priceless to you. That becomes priceless to you. And, and that's when we, we are forced to face down our inadequacies and to realize, I can't pull this off. I thought I was something really special. I can't pull this off. And this isn't working anymore. It, it, my, even, even all my, my super faith that I was, thought I was doing everything right, it's not working. But now, what am I left with? Now, I, I'm forced to seek the greatest thing of all, which is pr his presence. 
the presence of the Spirit, and I want something deeper and richer and truer. So listen, your faith is not measured by how much God is doing everything you told him to do. No, no. Your faith is measured by how faithful you are to seeking his presence, no matter what, no matter what is happening to you, no matter what's happening around you, how faithful are you to seeking his presence, to putting your trust in him? How faithful are you? Because here's what we know. Here's what I know. God is faithful. God is faithful all the time. And I don't understand all the mysteries of that either. I can't solve all the reason of that because I know we've all faced those things where we're like, man, I prayed for this and it didn't happen or this tragedy happens, or that tragedy happens. I, I, I know that God is faithful. I know God is faithful. I believe that to be true. And so maybe the prayer that we should all increasingly be praying here at Generations Church, my prayer for us is that we would pray, Spirit of Christ, how are you trying to work in me, even in this struggle? How are you even using this struggle to leverage it for my transformation? What are you doing? What are you up to here? How can I cooperate with you right now to let you have your way in me and through me? Because we can choose to participate with God or we can resist him. And I think God has had to show me uh, times in my life where I think I've been full of faith. I, th I thought I was being full of faith. but well, Actually, what I was doing is I was resisting his work. I was resisting what he wants to do. I find myself rebuking the devil when it's not the devil keeping me from finding my joy in God, it's me. I'm the only one keeping me from finding my joy because, because my definition of success is not God's. And we become too preoccupied with what we want him to do for us and we're too busy ignoring what he is wanting to do in us. Amen. I want to I wanna do something a little different today. How about we do something a little different for our closing prayer? Um, it's not very typical for us, but we're, we're used to being peculiar people, right? Uh, I want to pray a short prayer of blessing from the Apostle Paul. And I'd love for you to be thinking about those areas of your life where you need the Holy Spirit's power to be faithful. And for you, it might mean greater faithfulness to God. It can also mean faithfulness to your spouse. It could be faithfulness in your relationships with other people. Faithfulness is being committed for the long haul. What does faithfulness look like for you? And, and I'm sure that the Holy Spirit, if we've been listening, the Holy Spirit, even over this past hour, has been bringing things to our mind as, as we're talking. And I would love for you now, what I would just ask you to bow your heads with me right now in prayer. I'm going to read this little prayer of blessing from the Apostle Paul to encourage our hearts that this will be done. Hallelujah. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. 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 Praise God. Lord, make us.